freshmen, I'm going to read with you chapter one, um, and I'm going to try to stop and talk through different things that we're going to see as we go through chapter one, kind of like we would go through it if you were in my classroom and we were reading it together. Um, and so I always make a point of talking with my freshmen before we start this book, um, of talking about kind of like the historical context, um, because this book uh, was written at the time of the Great Depression. Uh, that was before um, the whole civil rights movement. And for that reason, um, this book does use the N-word. We know that that is not okay to do. And obviously, when I'm reading it to you, I will not be saying that word. Um, I want to address it because um, when, it, when this book was written, during the time that this book was written, that wasn't really looked down upon because the times were so different back then. So um, I just want you to be aware of that, that that word is in here. We will not be using it. And um, that, thank goodness, nowadays we have the education and the knowledge to know that that is not okay to talk about any group of uh, people that way. All right, so here we go with um, chapter one of Mice and Men. A few miles south of Soledad, the Salinas River drops in close to the hillside bank and runs deep and green. The water is warm, too, for it has, shipped, it has slipped twinkling over the yellow sands in the sunlight before reaching the narrow pool. On one side of the river, the golden foothill slopes curve up to the strong and rocky Gabalin Mountains, but on the valley, on the valley side of the water is lined with trees, willows fresh and green with every spring, carrying in their lower leaf junctures the debris of the winter's flooding, and sycamores with mottled white recumbent limbs and branches that arch over the pool. On the sandy bank under the trees, the leaves lie deep and so crisp that a lizard makes a great skittering if he runs amongst them. Rabbits come out of the brush to sit on the sand in the evening, and the damp flats are covered with the night tracks of coons, and with the spread pads of dogs from the ranches, and with the split wedge tracks of deers that come to drink in the dark. Okay, so this is the opening scene of the book. Uh, we are in California. This is talking about Soledad, the Salinas River. Um, Soledad and Salinas are kind of near uh, Santa Cruz and Monterey, if that gives you any kind of like reference point. Um, and then it talks about the Gabalin Mountains. The Gabalin Mountains um, are near Salinas, uh, kind of in between Salinas and Gilroy, I believe. Um, but basically what I want you to notice in this first paragraph is a skill that we've already practiced this year, which is the skill of imagery. Okay, um, if you remember from when we talked about imagery and practiced with it in our journal, imagery is when an author uses all five senses to create um, kind of like an image or a picture in the reader's mind. It kind of makes you feel like you're there. Um, so uh, let's point out a couple details that are like this. So it talks about the water being warm. It talks about uh, the water twinkling over the sand. We talk about the sound of the leaves kind of rustling as a lizard runs across them. Okay, so we have all these different um, descriptive uh, phrases, but basically what we need to know is we're here, we're out by kind of a creek or a river, and um, the wildlife is just kind of running free because it's not developed by humans yet, and we're just, this is where we open our story. There is a path through the willows and among the sycamores, a path beaten hard by boys coming down from the ranches to swim in the deep pool, and beaten hard by tramps who come wearily down from the highway in the evening to jungle up near water. In front of the low horizontal limb of a giant sycamore, there is an ash pile made by many fires. The limb is worn smooth by men who have sat on it. Okay, so uh, this place where we are near the river is a common place for people who are working on the ranches to come swim, camp out for a night or two. Um, and so the path is is uh, beaten down and it's a, it, it's, a, it's a path that you'd be able to spot easily because so many people have walked over it. Evening of a hot day started the little wind moving among the leaves. <coughs> the shades climbed up the hill toward the top. 
On the sandbanks, the rabbits sat as quietly as little gray sculptured stones. And then from the direction of the state highway came the sound of footsteps on crisp sycamore leaves. The rabbits hurried noiselessly for cover. A stilted heron labored up into the air and pounded down river. For a moment, the place was lifeless, and then two men emerged from the path and came into the opening by the green pool. Okay, so we're about to meet our two main characters, and they have just arrived to this clearing next to the river. They had walked in single file down the path, and even in the open, one stayed behind the other. Both were dressed in denim trousers and in denim coats with brass buttons. Both wore black, shapeless hats, and both carried tight blanket rolls slung over their shoulders. The first man was small and quick, dark of face with restless eyes and sharp, strong features. Every part of him was defined. Small, strong hands, slender arms, a thin and bony nose. Behind him walked his opposite. A huge man, shapeless of face, with large pale eyes, with wide sloping shoulders, and he walked heavily, dragging his feet a little, the way a bear drags his paws. His arms did not swing at his sides, but hung loosely. Okay, so we have our two main characters here. Um, the first one, he's really small. It describes him as being very defined. I imagine that means um, he has really well-defined muscles from hard work. Uh, but he's small, he's got um, like darker features. Um, and then the second character that's coming behind him, let's note that he's walking behind the smaller man. Um, and it describes him as being a huge man um, that he kind of like drags his feet a little when he's walking. He kind of resembles a bear because his arms aren't like moving around as he's walking. He's kind of like dragging his arms behind him. And so he's very different, okay? You should be able to see right away that these two characters are very different from each other. It's very similar to when we studied foils with Romeo and Juliet. Okay, so just keep that in mind as we hear more about these characters. The first man stopped short in the clearing and the follower nearly ran him over. He took off his hat and wiped the sweatband with the forefinger and snapped the moisture off. His huge companion dropped his blankets and flung himself down and drank from the surface of the green pool, drank with long gulps, snorting into the water like a horse. The small man stepped nervously beside him. Lenny, he said sharply, Lenny, for God's sake, don't drink so much. Lenny continued to snort into the pool. The small man leaned over and shook him by the shoulder. Lenny, you are gonna be sick like you was last night. Okay. Um, Lenny dipped his whole head under, hat and all, and then he sat up on the bank and his hat dripped down on his blue coat and ran down his back. That's good, he said. You drink some, George. You take a good big drink. He smiled happily. Okay. Um, so Lenny is very, I guess the best way to describe it, just from what we're seeing, is that he's kind of childlike. Like, he doesn't have a whole lot of um, manners, or he doesn't. He also doesn't have any reservations about drinking the creek water. He just knows it's good water. Um, his name is Lenny. Okay, so Lenny is the bigger man. George is the smaller man. And as we can see, it seems like George kind of bosses Lenny around or maybe tries to take care of him. No, you need to finish your math homework. Not yet. Go I shut my door. Sorry. sorry, guys. One second. Um, no, I didn't read the note all the way. You need to go down and finish finish your math homework. Close the door, dude. Okay. So, anywho, uh, we can kind of start to see this di this dynamic developing between Lenny and George which is that um, George seems to be the one in charge. We can also notice that Lenny was walking behind him, so George is kind of the leader. One more thing I forgot to point out is that they're carrying uh, backpacks, they're carrying sleeping bags, um, and so we can assume that these men uh, travel around a lot for their work. They don't really have a home necessarily where they would keep all their belongings. So what they have on their back is their, you know, most of their possessions, uh, a sleeping bag to sleep whenever they get where they're going. 
George unslung his bindle and dropped it gently on the bank. I ain't sure it's good water, he said. Looks kind of scummy. Lenny dabbled his big paw in the water and uh, wiggled his fingers so the water arose in little splashes. Rings widened across the pool to the other side and came back again. Lenny watched them go. Look, George, look what I done. George knelt beside the pool and drank from his hand with quick scoops. Tastes all right, he admitted. Don't really seem to be running, though. You never had to drink water that ain't running, Lenny, he said hopelessly. You'd drink out of a gutter if you was thirsty. He threw a scoop of water into his face and rubbed it about with his hands, under, the chin, under his chin and around the back of his neck. Then he replaced his hat, pushed himself back from the river, threw up his knees and embraced them. Lenny, who had been watching, imitated George exactly. He pushed himself back, drew up his knees, embraced them, looked over to George to see whether he had it just right. He pulled his hat down a little more over his eyes, the way George's hat was. Okay, so this reveals another uh, portion of kind of like how they relate to each other, which is that um, Lenny watches George and he tries to imitate him. He uh, he really looks up to George and he recognizes him as a leader. So Lenny is always trying to copy George. He's always trying to please George using the right words or doing the right thing. Okay, so um, it almost seems like in every respect that George is the boss of Lenny. Um, so let's keep going and see how that's going to develop. George stared morosely at the water. The rims of his eyes were red with sun glare. He said angrily, we could just as well have rode clear to the ranch if that bus driver knew what he was talking about. Just a little stretch down the highway, he says. Just a little stretch? Damn near four miles, that's what it was. Didn't want to stop at the ranch gate, that's what. Too damn lazy to pull up. Wonder he isn't too damn good to stop at Soledad at all. Kicks us out and sets just a little stretch down the road. I bet it was more than four miles damn hot day. Okay, so the bus driver apparently drove, uh, dropped them off far away from the job site and they had to walk four miles or so. Um, George is very irritated about this. Okay, so Lenny looked timidly over to him. George, yeah, what do you want? Where are we going, George? The little man jerked down the brim of his hat and scowled over at Lenny. So you forgot that already, did you? I gotta tell you again, do I? Man, you're a crazy guy. I forgot, Lenny said so softly. I tried not to forget. Honest to God, I did, George. Okay, okay, I'll tell you again. I ain't got nothing to do. Might just as well spend all my time telling you things and then you forget them and I tell you again. Tried and tried, said Lenny. But it didn't do no good. I remember about the rabbits, George. The hell with the rabbits. That's all you can ever remember is them rabbits. Okay, now you listen this time. Uh, you listen and this time you got to remember so we don't get in no trouble. You remember sitting in that gutter on Howard Street and watching that blackboard? Lenny's face broke into a delighted smile. Why, sure, George, I remember that. But what did we do then? I, I remember some girls come by and you says, you says, the hell with what I says. You remember about us going into Murray and Reddy's and they give us work cards and bus tickets. Oh, sure, George, I remember that now. His hands went quickly into his side pockets. He said gently, George, I ain't got mine. I must have lost it. He looked down at the ground in despair. You never had none, you crazy guy. I got both of them here. I think I'd let you carry your own work card? Lenny grinned with relief. I, I thought I put it in my side pocket. His hand went into the pocket again. George looked sharply at him. What did you take out of that pocket? Ain't a thing in my pocket, Lenny said cleverly. I know there ain't. You got it in your hand. What you got in your hand? Hiding it. I ain't got nothing, George. Honest. Come on, give it here. Lenny held his closed hand away from George's direction. It's only a mouse, George. 
A mouse? A live mouse? Uh-uh, just a dead mouse, George. I didn't kill it. Honest, I found it. I found it dead. Give it here, said George. Aw, oh, leave me have it, George, uh, Lenny said. Give it here. Lenny's hands slowly obeyed. George took the mouse and threw it across the pool to the other side among the brush. What do you want of a dead mouse anyway? I could pet it with my thumb while we walked along, said Lenny. Well, you ain't petting no mice while you walk with me. You remember where we going now? Lenny looked startled and then, in embarrassment, hid his face against his knees. I forgot again. Geez, George said resignedly. Well, look, we're going work on a ranch like the one we came from up north. Up north? In weed. Oh, sure, I remember in weed. That ranch we're going to is right down there about a quarter mile. We're going to go in and see the boss. Now, look, I'll give him the work tickets, but you ain't going to say a word. You just stand there and don't say nothing. If he finds out what a crazy guy you are, we won't get no job. But if he sees you work before he hears you talk, we're set. You got that? Sure, George. Sure. I got it. Okay, a couple of things I want to point out. First of all, we know that they just came from a place where they were working. Um, it mentions a place called Murray and Reddy's, which I believe Murray and Reddy's is like a place where they would stop and find out which ranch they were going to go work at next. They were given bus tickets and they were given their work cards. George all, uh, George keeps Lenny's things onto him because um, he's afraid that Lenny will lose them. Probably this is a pretty good instinct because we can see right now that Lenny is not really able to remember much of anything that George tells him. Okay, he says he remembers about the rabbits. The rabbits are important. We'll talk about those later. And we notice that he has in his pocket a dead mouse. That is disgusting. Okay, he has the dead mouse in his pocket because he just wants to pet it as he walks. So you're probably getting um, a pretty good idea or understanding for what Lenny's um, mental limitations might be. And so it seems like George kind of takes care of him to keep him safe. Um, you can probably tell that George is kind of a grunt. He, uh, he kind of gets annoyed with having to take care of Lenny, but at the same time, he does it because Lenny is with his best friends and his family. Um, and the plan is, when they go to talk to the new boss, George will do all the talking, Lenny will stay quiet, um, in the hope that the boss will see Lenny work before he hears Lenny talk. Because if he hears Lenny talk first, he might not let him have his job. He might think that Lenny's limitations are going to make him a bad employee or something like that. Um, okay, now, when we go in to see the boss, what are we going to do? I, I, Lenny thought, his face grew uh, tight with thought. I ain't going to say nothing. Just going to stand there. Good boy, that's well. You say that. Over two, three times so you won't forget. Lenny droned to himself softly. I ain't gonna say nothing. I ain't gonna say nothing. I ain't gonna say nothing. Okay, said George. And you ain't gonna do no bad things like you done in weed either. Sorry, hold on. What time? The dogs did? Okay. Listen. The dogs need to go out. You need to stay out of my room. You can, I'll be down in a little bit when I'm done, but you need to leave me alone. Don't come in here again. So you can take a break, but you need to stay downstairs. Yeah, yep. Close my door and don't come back in until I'm done. Sorry, you guys, it's really hard to teach while I'm also trying to take care of my kids. Okay, so anywho, um, Lenny is repeating in his head over and over again. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. But George comes up to things that are important, he says. And you ain't going to do no bad things like you've done in weed, neither. Lenny looks puzzled. Like I've done in weed? Oh, so you forgot that too, did ya? Well, I ain't going to remind you. Here, you do it again. 
a light of understanding built on what is first. They run us out of need, he quoted triumphantly. Run us out, hell, said George disgustedly. We run. They was looking for us. They didn't catch us. Lenny giggled happily. I didn't forget that, you bet. George lay back on the sand and crossed his hands under his head, and Lenny imitated him, raising his head to see whether he was doing it right. God, you're a lot of trouble, said George. I could get along so easy and so nice if I didn't have you on my tail. I could live so easy and maybe have a girl. For a moment, Lenny lay quiet, and then he said hopefully, we could work on a ranch, George. All right, you got that. But we're going to sleep here because I got a reason. The day was going fast now. Only the tops of the Babylon Mountains sprang to the light of the sun that had gone from the valley. A water snake slipped along on the pool, its head held up like a little periscope. The reeds jerked slightly in the current. Far off toward the highway, a man shouted something and another man shouted back. The sycamore limbs rustled under a little wind that died immediately. George, why ain't we going on to the ranch and get some supper? They got supper at the ranch. George rolled on his side. No reason at all for you. I like it here. Tomorrow we're going to go to work. I've seen thrashing machines on the way down. That means we're going to be bucking grain bags, busting a gut. Tonight, I'm going to lay right here and look up. I like it. Lenny got up on his knees and looked down at George. Ain't we going to have no supper? Sure we are, if you gather up some dead willow sticks. Got three cans of beans in my bindle. You get a fire ready. I'll give you a match when you have the sticks together. Then we'll heat the beans and have supper. Lenny said, I like beans with pasta. Well, we ain't got no pasta. You go get wood. Don't you fool around. It'll be dark before me. Okay, so apparently something happened uh, at the place where they were last working. They got run out of the place, meaning they got fired. The men were chasing them down, and they got away. Um, so we that's why they have to be extra careful when they come into this new job site, and that's why Lenny is supposed to stay quiet while George does the talking. George wants to stay here by the lake. I'm sorry, the river tonight, because um, he knows when they get there in the morning, they're going to have to do a bunch of work. So he says, let's just stay here by the river. We'll relax a little bit, and then we will um, go on to the job site tomorrow. Uh, they're going to have beans out of a can for dinner. And Lenny, will Lenny like some ketchup with his beans? Lenny lumbered to his feet and disappeared in the brush. George lay where he was and whistled softly to himself. There were sounds of splashings down on the river in the direction Lenny had taken. George stopped whistling and listened. Poor guy, he said softly, and then went on whistling again. In a moment, Lenny came crashing back through the brush. He carried one small willow stick in his hand. George sat up. All right, he said brusquely. Give me that mouse. Okay, so... George sends Lenny down to, like down the river to collect some sticks so they can make a fire. And Lenny comes back with one stick in his hand, you guys. Okay, so George automatically knows Lenny probably went and found the dead mouse. He says, give it back to me. But Lenny made an elaborate pantomime of innocence. What mouse, George? <clears throat> I ain't got no mouse. George held out his hand. Come on, give it to me. You ain't putting nothing over. Lenny hesitated, backed away, looked wildly at the brush line, as though he contemplated running for his freedom. George said coldly, You gonna give me the mouse or do I have to sock you? Give you what, George? You know damn well what I, what. I want that mouse. Lenny reluctantly reached into his pocket. His voice broke a little. I don't know why I can't keep it. It ain't nobody's mouse. I didn't steal it. I found it lying right beside the road. George's hand remained outstretched imperiously. Slowly, like a terrier who doesn't want to bring a ball to its master, Lenny approached, drew back, approached again. George snapped his finger sharply, and at the sound, Lenny laid the mouse in his hand. 
wasn't doing nothing bad with it, George. Just stroking it. George stood up and threw the mouse as far as he could into the darkening brush. And then he stepped to the pool and washed his hands. You crazy fool, don't you think I could see your feet was wet from where you went across the river to get it? He heard Lenny's whimpering cry and wheeled about, blubbering like a baby. A big guy like you? Lenny's lip quivered and tears started in his eyes. Ah, oh, Lenny, George put his hand on Lenny's shoulder. I ain't taking it away just for meanness. That mouse ain't fresh, Lenny. And besides, you broke it, you broke it, petting it. You get another mouse that's fresh and I'll let you keep it a while. Lenny sat down on the ground and hung his head dejectedly. I don't know where there is no other mouse. I remember a lady used to give them to me uh, every time she got, but that lady ain't here. George scoffed. Lady, huh? Don't even remember who that lady was? That was your own Aunt Clara and she stopped giving them to you. You always killed them. Lenny looked sadly up at him. That was, they was so little, he said apologetically. I pet him and pretty soon they bit my fingers and I pinched their heads a little and then they was dead because they was so little. I wish we'd get the rabbits pretty soon, George. They ain't so little. The hell with the rabbits. And you ain't to be trusted with no live mice. Your Aunt Clara gave you a rubber mouse and you wouldn't have nothing to do with it. It wasn't no good to pet, said Lenny. The flame of the sunset lifted from the mountains and uh, mountaintops and dusk came into the valley and a half darkness came in around the wind, the willows and the sycamores. A big carp rose to the surface of the pool, gulped air and then sank mysteriously into the dark water again, leaving widening rings on the water. Overhead, the leaves whisked again, and little puffs of willow cotton blew down and landed on the pool's surface. You gonna get that wood? George demanded. There's plenty right up against the back of that sycamore. Floodwater wood. Now you go get it. Okay, I'm going to stop the video at that point and I'll do the rest of um, this chapter on a separate video because this video is getting really long. Okay, so here comes part two.